a first look at our findings uh, with a pilot that we've titled Trans Wellness, Trans Brilliance. And this was developed by and for our trans and gender diverse community uh, with the goals of advancing emotional wellness and resilience. Uh, I myself, my name is Brayden Mishowick. Uh, I use he, him, or they, them pronouns. I am a co-founder of Transcend the Binary that provides a litany of supportive services, uh, provider education training, and then where I'm carving out my role and most interested in is research. And so that's also my role with Trans Wellness Trans Brilliance is I am a lead researcher on this and uh, in a community partner and co-investigator. Awesome. Yes. Um, and I am Cecil or C. McGee. I am a fifth year doctoral candidate at the University of Michigan in the Joint Program for Psychology and Women's and Gender Studies. Uh, I was the project manager for this particular project. Um, and helped with research and analysis. Um, most of my research primarily has to deal with um, queer wellness and embodiment, specifically for trans gender diverse folks. Also on our team, our research team was Dr. Shana Katari of um, also of the University of Michigan of the School of Social Work. They were the co-principal investigator with Brayden. Uh, I don't believe they could join us today though, however. So, things that are going to happen today. Uh, we're going to talk about how this project started. We'll talk about the actual intervention itself. We'll talk about the pilot, some preliminary findings, um, next steps, and then a wrap up. Um, we timed this earlier. We think this is maybe a little about an hour of talking, and then we'll have some we'll time, time for a Q&A at the end. So with that, Let's get to the origin story. So this actually goes back to 2015 and co-founding Transcend with my late co-founder who happened to be a pharmacist. Um, and next slide, please. Mm -hmm. uh, so our vision for supporting wellness for the community in, in 2015 is we were establishing Transcend the Binary. Uh, he brought a medical focus, I brought a mental health focus, and together we were both very interested in holistic or integrative well-being. And we recognized through our work of supporting the community uh, and my lived experience as a community member, how the social realms of life affect well-being, especially among stigmatized groups. So I was uh, doing some exploratory internet surfing and that's how I found this article on the right here. Uh, Dr. Dentato is not the first to come up with the minority stress theory, but this was the article that introduced me to it, um, referencing uh, articles by Meyer in 1995 and 2003. Uh, up to this point, uh, it had been primarily used with sexual minorities, looking at like the mental health consequences of stigma. And it I really resonated with minority stress because it felt like a really good framework to explain what we were seeing across our community. So from psychosocial environmental factors, uh, you know, living with a majority dominant culture that is uh, not quite understanding or there's a lot of stigma and that sort of thing. Uh, so, so having that stigmatized minority, um, this minority stress framework breaks down stress into like distal stress. So things that are external to yourself, uh, family rejection, discrimination, those experiences, and then proximal stress or in proximity to that, how one might internalize those experiences and, and stigma. And I was inspired by the minority stress framework and I wanted to know how does this apply to my community? So in 2015, we started to develop with Transcend a cross-sectional survey, which we named later Finding Our Strength. And this survey had a variety of measures, such as self-reported health. We used validated scales, such as what we're looking at here, which was the, uh, what we're actually looking at is, um, it's a, a snippet of a four foot by six foot panel. Uh, and that was part of a, a traveling interactive exhibit um, that we used to share our findings. And I wanted to pull this snippet because if we're talking about minority stress, that's anxiety. And 
here we can see our community's responses per our survey. Um, and we looked at the PHQ-2, which is depression risk, and then the GAD-7. What's interesting about the GAD-7 is it actually breaks it down into several subgroups. So minimal anxiety, mild, moderate, and severe. And so you can see here that our respondents, four and five, reported having anxiety. Comparative to the U.S. population, that is 18%. What I also want to pare down is that when we looked among those who had anxiety, if 18% of the U.S. population has anxiety, including minor, minor uh, minimal, mild, moderate, and severe, our respondents, 30% reported severe anxiety. So more than double of the total amount of anxiety in the general population. So this is alarming and something that we wanted to uh, further look at. What Running with the minority stress framework, we created an ad hoc scale around trying to understand how much worry of discrimination do people feel across daily life? So daily life being home, uh, family, social engagements, work, school, peer groups, professional events, clinical care settings. We looked at all of that and we asked, how much do you worry? And for the scale, if someone responded not a lot or very little, that would get us a zero all the way up to a lot, which would be a two. And we wanted to understand how worry related to different measures of wellness. And we found that greater discrimination worry was positively correlated with greater severity. So the more worry about discrimination, the greater the severity, also negatively related to uh, lower reports of health. So worse health with greater worry about discrimination. What's notable about this is we developed the survey in 2015, but the field of study was actually conducted from June to November 1st of 2016. So if we rewind back the tapes, uh, that was right before the election outcome. So our survey closed prior to the general election in 2016 and knowing the results. Next slide, please. In addition to minority stress, another way to look at it is we use the heightened vigilance scale. So I wanted to share this with everyone to illuminate how pervasive this anxiety can be in terms of what it's like to live with it. And I feel that this scale does a, does a really awesome job. We adapted the scale because for trans folks, like bathrooms, locker rooms, those type of facilities are also another part of daily life that maybe the general population doesn't have to navigate, but we do. And so what we found here is the results of this, uh, this heightened scale where we, we see that many avoidance tactics are taken by our community. So seven out of 10 of us reported avoiding social situations and places. That's a lot. Um, and 45% of us responded that we plan our day around safe facilities and we're also talking about nearly half actually before leaving home will mentally prepare for insults before going about your day. So maybe avoiding places and then the places that you do go preparing for insults before you arrive. What I wanna highlight that's not on this panel is that we, the scale is actually like, how much do you worry like almost daily? maybe a couple times a week, maybe a couple times a month, maybe a couple times a year or less than once a year. So like never. And for trying to prepare for insults before leaving home, 26% of respondents reported almost every day that that was something that they would do almost every single day. 39% reported that they feel like they have to be careful about their appearance in order to get good service and avoid being harassed. And 44% re responded with it almost every day. They're carefully watching about what they say and how they say it. And then 46%, um, yeah, to in total had responded had responded to avoiding uh, social situations and places. So these are very high numbers. Um, next slide, please. One of the other things that we looked at with finding our strength and kind of the namesake of the survey is we wanted to know how do people cope so what are the internal resources that we're leveraging or the resources around us? And so through doing 
discussions with the community and some research, we identified across those different realms of life that I mentioned earlier. So daily life, school, work, healthcare. Um, we basically created uh, a bunch of items that people could say if they did it and if they did it, how effective was it? And what I want to highlight here for you for the purposes of, of understanding the intervention that we developed is that what we found with finding our strength in terms of like our correlative analysis is that um, folks who had predominant passive coping skills, so higher scores on passive, we also found that that correlated with greater depression, more loneliness, poorer health, and more severe anxiety. Using predominantly active, we didn't see any correlations, no relationship. A blend of both was fine. The emphasis being predominantly passive coping skills, that's when we found that there were relationships with these other measures. So this wasn't the only research that we did. This is where I actually got connected with Dr. Katari. Uh, we actually met at um, the Finding Our Strength launch. Um, and what they were interested in doing was creating a state-specific, basically basically like a health uh, baseline healthline measure for the state. So we worked together with Michigan Health Trans Survey. So you can see here part of the, the promotional materials that Transcend created. And um, what we found is that there was a lot of disparities in access to care specifically mental health services, and specifically in areas in Michigan that were like more rural. Um, and then we also found some other interesting factors around like internal and external barriers to well-being, some of it being like an intimate partner violence. So we felt that like healthy relationships was another important component that we could take from these previous re research that we had done and integrate it into what has now become trans wellness, trans brilliance. So essentially, we wanted to move from like cross-sectional surveys and translate those findings into an actual intervention, like engaging with our community and building on the strengths within our community, but also working to try to, uh, you know, tap into mechanisms that can increase well-being. And so that's where we built Trans Wellness, Trans Brilliance. This is essentially the backstory to what led us to realizing that there are definitely support groups that exist. Uh, there are many that are virtual, but what we did not find were really any that were skill building specific. So we went on this mission of identifying some coping strategies and some psychoeducation uh, and, and, and creating group spaces where people could build on these skills together. Yeah. So bearing all that origin story in mind, um, one of the things that's important for us to talk about is the methodology behind trans wellness, trans brilliance. Sometimes people say methodology and methods like they are synonyms, but they're actually quite different. Methodology is the framework or the lens that guides research, while methods are the tools you use to conduct that research. So any tools that you use are never value free. Uh, you're always bringing a lot of assumptions, beliefs, and theories into the how you're using them. And so for this project, we are very intentional with thinking about, okay, what theories are we drawing upon when doing this work? And specifically, we drew upon trans feminist theory, the Kalama back in 20, 2001, which says that the meanings we ascribe to gender and sex are constructed but the experiences we have in our particular sex and gendered embodiments are very real. It also says that anyone should be able to engage in whatever bodily practices make them feel most comfortable in their own skin. We also drew upon intersectionality theory, which was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw back in uh, 1989. This theory recognizes that the intersection and interaction of multiple forms of oppression racism, sexism, classism, ableism, sexism, you name it, produce social injustice. Um, and that our lived experiences are shaped by interlocking systems of power. So we're not just thinking about having a bunch of identities, we're thinking about like how power is interfacing with us because of the assumptions it makes about our identities. We are also thinking about critical theory, which aims to disrupt the status quo Critical theory says that reality is constructed and power relations shape each of those realities for each of us. Um, because of this, critical theorists often try to do research that undoes the work 
of hierarchical systems. And bearing all of this in mind, um, we were thinking about epistemology as well. So epistemology is your approach to how you can know and what we can know when doing research. There are different types of it out there, but for this project, we used a critical ideological epistemology where the goal is to incite transformation and learning um, in participants to ultimately help them combat oppression themselves in their own lives. And so interconnected with the values and the approach uh, is a community-led methodology. So some of the, the values behind working with communities that is informed by um, the uh, our founding methodology that Cecil just spoke to would transcend. This is something that's really important to us. We center the community and the perspectives and the program building and the research that we do. And in order to do that effectively, there's a couple components that we uh, like to kind of enumerate. And that is, first of all, it's building trust. And you can't do that without holding respect and dignity for the people that you're serving. And that means also recognizing the lived experience, the expertise that is inherent in that and learning from the community. So uh, my co-founder, my late co-founder, he, as an ally, would talk about how important it is to share space. And through sharing space, you're able to, to gain shared experience. You can read all you want in a textbook, but it's when you're working with people and integrating with them and learning from them that you can really grow your understanding. And that process is never done. It's This is a continual repeat, a continual cycle. And in that, you're not only learning from the community, but you're empowering through skill building and upskilling. So that could look like sharing your knowledge and, and, and from a research standpoint, educating like, hey, you know what? Here's some components of data integrity that might be helpful for you to think about. Here's why you may or may not want to use this validated scale or adapt it. Uh, and really empowering that information, but also working together to collaborate in a way that is actually very community centered. So as Cecil had mentioned, it's disrupting power, it's power sharing, it's working with the community. Uh, and so these are really important val values to being able to being able to do community led effectively and engaging communities. And that's something that um, even myself, I'm a community member. However, I am one person with one perspective. So this requires that we are continually going back to our community and having different ways to gain feedback and inform how we do things and cross verify with the community. And so when you take this and you take that approach that is continual, um, you use that throughout the entire uh, you know, research life cycle, which is essentially what we're looking at here. Yeah. So what happened here? <laughs> A lot of stuff. Um, so back in 2020, um, we started doing a lit review of what was out there already um, on virtual wellness interventions. From that literature, we were able to see that nothing like this program had ever been done before, specifically for transgender diverse folks. Um, and we also gathered a bunch of ideas around what worked well for research teams who had done virtual wellness interventions aimed at improving health of some sort. In general, best practices we discovered were uh, synchronous virtual interventions where participants could interact with each other in real time, be with humans one-on-one, -on -one, um, interventions that were six to eight weeks long, where people met at least once a week for 60 to 90 minutes, we saw that interventions where participants were kind of capped anywhere between four to eight folks with six people being the sweet spot worked well. Um, a lot of that research suggested also that having a facilitator was quite helpful. Um, just putting people in a space together without someone to guide that discussion wasn't, wasn't useful. Um, people wanted weekly topics, they wanted structured interaction. Um, and having people there to troubleshoot any technology problems also helped make sure that things went smoothly and, and everybody's needs were met in real time. And the literature review is something that was ongoing throughout the process, but early on in terms of gaining uh, more of the, the community-led perspective where we're getting 
expert opinions from people in the community, uh, the first thing that we did is we conducted qualitative interviews. And what's notable here is that the criteria for the folks that we recruited and selected, we were looking for people who A, were members of our community, trans, gender diverse, non, non-binary. And we were looking for folks who had a certain role and connection with our community. We recognize that someone who provides wellness services, whether clinically or through a community organizations such as like youth and young adult programming or older adult programming, uh, or folks who are, uh, you know, embedded in their community in a way where they're thinking about how do we fill gaps? How do we create community? How do we support people? We really wanted to first start with the key perspectives that these types of folks would be able to provide us from their dual role perspective. And so that led to, you know, really interesting findings. Uh, first of all, we were looking for individuals across geographic area of Michigan. And what we were able to learn from these semi-structured interviews was, A, that this program's needed, that skill building and creating space and creating space for community together was something that would foreseeably create benefits. We were on the right track. As far as for the vulnerabilities of our community, there was a lot of emphasis around interpersonal, such as dating. Uh, there were a lot of factors around like boundary setting and how to navigate the world around us. We also learned uh, from people some really wonderful recommendations in terms of like what skills might be applicable to do like psychoeducation on and then some like exercises around. So just to name a couple of those, like we learned about the polyvagal theory. We learned about how uh, you know, educating people on hypo, hyper arousal states and being able to, to understand your own triggers and understand your own emotional states and how you sense and feel them, um, that that can be really beneficial. Uh, we learned about the benefits of window of tolerance. So understanding your cues and being able to understand when you reached your threshold, uh, more about the vagal nerve. So these are more like clinically technical components, but we did weave them into our program We also received a lot of recommendations for additional resources. So workbooks um, on how to create coping plans, workbooks and exercises around understanding oppression and oppression in the body. And also we learned about a lot of components around um, like just unique experiences in more rural areas. So as mentioned before, we knew that that was a gap in services. And so we wanted to understand what might be particularly benefit beneficial for more underserved geographical locations across Michigan. Yeah. So we took all of that information from the stakeholder interviews, as well as the literature review, um, and started drafting the intervention itself. In the beginning, it was just a skeleton of eight week chunks on a Google doc. Um, We identified seven large topics that were highlighted in those interviews and started playing around with where to put those on that outline, thinking about other things we could research um, based on those conversations, like the window of tolerance, looking more into that, finding activities, finding um, informational sheets. um, And we played around with wording and order, thought about flow. It was a lot of puzzle piece juggling to kind of get things to fit together. After we kind of got something, that we felt a little good with, we wanted to get more feedback. And that's where we went to looking for members of our community that would be eligible for the pilot program that we were developing. So for adults, people who are residents of Michigan, Uh, but also we were looking for individuals, unlike the first cohort uh, with the qualitative interviews, we were looking for people who would potentially be benefactors of such a service. So we were not looking for individuals who are leaders or had any type of other connection with the community. Uh, And then also factoring in uh, identity, geography, gender, intersectional experiences, and so forth. And we ran that focus group. Uh, We only had one. And we went over uh, an overview of our program, objectives, goal, 
uh, platform. We dove deep into the topics. We dove deep into some example exercises. And we wanted to know, are we on the right track? Is this something that you think would be engaging? Is this something that you think would be beneficial? Is this something that you think can help the community? And we received a lot of really positive affirmation around those components. Um, as far as the content, we even tried to figure out like, what could we cut? And there were no clear lowest rankings among the content. The feedback that we received was like, this is all important. And the concerns were, um, you know, how, um, what, as far as our program objectives, what could be realistically achievable in terms of creating change? Uh, so that was really the, the primary hesitation that we had gained from the focus group. Yeah, after the focus group, we went to a revision stage. Uh, we used that information shared by those participants as well as staff reviewers. Um, so we had a licensed clinical social worker look over the intervention outline as well as a peer support specialist assistant. Um, and we used all of that to refine instructions, play around with the topic flow, swap out activities, um, and ensure that the language and the materials just felt accessible to anybody really who picked them up. Once we did all of that, we felt like it was time to put this out into the world, to set it loose. Um, so we started to pilot it. And this began this year, uh, March in 2023. So if you've been following along, it's been like a three-year process uh, so far. Um, so let's get into the actual intervention itself. We mentioned a little bit about the objectives, but let's dive a little bit more clearly in our objective framework for trans wellness, trans brilliance. And overall, we wanted to improve participant mental health. So we were looking at coping strategies, different ways that, um, different types of like psych psychoeducation that uh, peer support specialists could lead and facilitate discussion around, uh, activities that people could take into their own individual life and practice and come back to the group and really unpack. And so we were looking for content that would, um, you know, uh, improve resilience, improve uh, emotional wellness. Uh, we were looking for helping to empower community members to understand the different ways that stress impacts them in their daily life and what they can do to navigate those situations that crop up. Um, and we also wanted to reduce isolation and link folks to affirming providers. And we also had a secondary goal, which was, uh, and this is very much like a transcend perspective where Yes, we're providing services to the community, but we're also building up skills of those who are providing services to the community. So uh, it was very important for us to, it, it was not lost on us that we were developing peer facilitation skills. And also our peer support specialists who we selected were across multiple identities and then geographically diverse intentionally so that people could build these skills and take it back to their community. So in terms of the intervention itself, um, it was designed to be virtual. And this was not necessarily because of COVID in 2020. This was already the plan from the outset. Um, it just happened to happen at the same time. Um, and as Braden mentioned earlier, this was largely because we recognized there were a lot of transgender diverse Michiganders who didn't necessarily have access to providers because they were in rural locations um, and that it would be difficult to have them go somewhere, drive somewhere, because um, access to a vehicle or transportation isn't necessarily the case for a lot of folks. So we wanted everybody to be able to join into these sessions on their own devices, wherever they were in Michigan. We also wanted this to be peer led. So Braden was mentioning the peer support specialists. Peer support specialists were just basically like regular people in the community who were committed uh, to strengthening community and wellness of folks around them. Um, they weren't trained, licensed clinicians of any sort. Um, we wanted to make sure this could be something that anyone could pick up um, if they were committed enough to the outcome and they were willing to learn that they could pick this up and implement it in their own area. Um, this was designed to be eight weeks of uh, meeting once a week 
the aim in the beginning was for it to be about an hour and a half each week. And then folks were doing individual practice outside of that. And then the other aim based off of the lit review that we had done previously was to make sure that the groups had about six to eight participants, no more than eight participants felt like it was going to get a little too much to manage. And some folks wouldn't be able to participate as much potentially. Each group um, from the outset, we decided would have two facilitators. One would be that peer support specialist who did most of the facilitating, most of the talking and guiding during the group itself. Um, and the other would be a mental health clinician, um, just as like a safety net, but also make sure that uh, the peer support specialists were being able to learn from them about the best way to implement certain topics and ideas. In terms of a session structure, each week, the way this looked was there was a beginning chunk with groundings and affirmations. Um, it was, there was a check-in maybe about the homework that had been assigned last week, how that had, won, had gone, things people had discovered. The core of those sessions involved introducing new topics, um, talking about them, having a very vulnerable and candid conversation about what these things looked like in people's lives and in different activities. Um, it wasn't just a lecture. It wasn't just a one-way delivery of information. This was a conversation amongst folks, um, but also informative. And then the end of that weekly um, session would look like re a reflection, um, maybe another exercise to just kind of like bring people back to the space. And then a discussion of the weekly take-home exercise, which was always optional. We didn't require anybody to do that. Um, it was just a, another way for them to practice. And as I mentioned, there were eight weeks. And so these are the, the topics that guided each week's session is what the material was built around. Um, so we made sure that this was built around the needs and the skills raised by the community um, stakeholders when we did those interviews way back when. Um, so week one, curiosity, non-judgment and values. Week two got into mindfulness, which is a word a lot of people throw around, but we wanted to have people have a chance to actually like grapple with that and try it out for themselves. Week three, awareness in our bodies. Um, just being in your body was something that we, we heard a lot was difficult for folks. And we wanted to be able to like untap that. Um, week four, we thought about emotions and sensations, also something sometimes it's a little inaccessible for folks. Um, week five, we thought about activations, things that are kind of triggering in certain areas, ladders of safety. Week six, navigating the world around us. Um, as Braden mentioned earlier with the previous research, people were struggling with this idea like of how to, how to move through public spaces and, and feel safe um, and know what to do in certain situations. This week involved a lot of planning in advance, um, thinking through like, all right, if I was in this situation, what could I do? Instead of just doing it in real time, um, there was a lot of work of just like creating that backpack, if you will, so you're ready to do when it shows up. Week seven, we had also heard that a lot of folks were kind of struggling like, like what do I do with family? What do I do with like partners when I come out? Like, I, I don't really know what to do, like dating. Nobody talks about this stuff for trans folks. So week seven, we've specifically focused on navigating interpersonal relationships. And then at the very end, week eight, was a reflection, was a closing, was a way for people to reflect on, you know, like, what did you learn? What, what happened in this experience? What are we taking away? And then also as an opportunity for people to stay in contact if they wanted, um, because it's hard to make friends as an adult, especially whenever you're a trans Michigander living in some really rural area. And so this is just an example of what week three looked like, um, where we were focusing on awareness in our bodies. You can see at the beginning, we got that grounding affirmation section, and then the big chunk, two through four, we're talking about um, the nitty gritty, the meat of it all. Uh, we've got a variety of exercises in there, um, workbooks, some folks use PowerPoints to talk through topics, whatever worked. Um, and at the end, you know, check out reflection. So that's the intervention itself as, in a nutshell. And it doesn't look like a lot, this chunk right here for week three, but that 
actually was a lot of time and a lot of conversation. And um, in some of our groups, we even found it took a little longer than an hour and a half to get through some of those because people were so engaged. So let's talk about the pilot itself. Thank you. So when we talk about the, the design, again, the time frame eight weeks, uh, when this actually happened and took place, we had gotten IRB approval. And I think within like nine days, we recruited and launched. <laughs> yeah, it was a quick turnaround time. We didn't get approval until maybe the end of February, beginning of March. Um, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yes, rapid fire. But it started in mid-March and it ended in mid-May. And we had four cohorts, groups of six to eight participants. And again, primarily led by peer support specialists with the backup support from a licensed mental health clinician. And the meeting times were about an hour and a half. To some groups, they took two hours. There was eight sessions held over Zoom. That was the weekly, uh, you know, getting together as the group and learning skills and doing some grounding together. And then individually doing some practice in between. And with that, we'll talk a little bit more about the measures. But as from a research design standpoint, we implemented a pre post test, it was mixed method survey. And then we also transcend sponsored an additional survey because we really wanted to understand, um, I guess you could say, exposure to our treatment variables where we wanted to know in addition to participating in the groups, how much people were using the skills in between, because we felt that that would be really helpful data to have, in addition to getting more timely feedback, because we knew that after eight weeks, it would be really hard to dig into, what did you like about this? Or how could this have been better? So we had a five minute brief weekly reflection that got a little bit of feedback on the session and the skills and, and really wanted to know what was the exposure in individual practice. And it might be worth mentioning also um, where the peer support specialists and the clinicians came from. Um, so <laughs> this was its own process, but essentially all of the peer support specialists and the clinicians um, were either trans, gender diverse themselves, or they had ex ex extensive experience working with the community. Um, and we reached out to contacts that we had in the community. And we also, we did like a... Um, yeah, it was a survey, didn't we? We launched a survey out there in the world and we asked people, you know, why do you want to be a peer support specialist? Um, and then we we met and decided who seemed like a good fit for this project. But anyway, let's talk about the participant recruitment. So that was something that Transcend, we, we led. Uh, we've had now multiple experience with, you know, uh, engaging members of our community through research and so what we did in that very fast turnaround uh, is we reached out to all our organizational partners, we hit our listservs, we did social media outreach, and within one week, we had over 170 applicants. And what you're seeing here are uh, everything that's highlighted in either green or purple means that we received applicants from that location. And uh, from an intersectional standpoint, purple is highlighting folks who were uh, essentially non-white. Yeah. And we try to be very intentional whenever we were recruiting people to make sure that um, at least 50% of the folks that were invited to take part in this were folks of color. Um, we didn't want this to be an entirely white centric um, population. So in terms of participants, um, we invited 32 people to participate in the program. Um, this was a very quick turnaround time of, uh, emailing and then we did a phone call screening to ensure they were actually interested and that they were available at the specific time for the group. Um, ultimately, we had 29 people enroll and then 23 people finished the program. And by, when we say finish, we mean that they started it the very beginning, took the pretest survey, and then they attended more than, I think, half of the weekly meetings and then finished with the post-test survey. Um, so this is the demographic breakdown of all the folks that finished. Most of the folks um, who did participate our program all the way to the end were trans masks, trans men, trans males, um, followed by non-binary, trans femme, female, women, um, trans mask, non-binary, genderqueer and gender fluid, two-spirit, 
average age of the folks that ended up participating were was 31 years. Average income was around 32,000, but this was very, very broad. Um, we had some folks who had no income at all, who just lost their jobs. We had some folks that were doing pretty well, closer to 90,000. Um, most of the folks that participated in this were pansexual and bisexual. Folks that ended up finishing, majority of them were white, about 61%, followed by multi and biracial, Black and or African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, and Indigenous. And the locations that ended up being served the most were rural and suburban. Um, with the southeast, southwest, and the northwest of the lower peninsula being represented, and then the northeast of the upper peninsula. Also worth mentioning, um, a lot of our participants uh, were disabled, about 74%, and about 30% of them held bachelor's degrees. There was a, a wide variety of, of educational backgrounds, however. So we asked our folks to complete a pre-program survey and a post-program survey, as Braden said, and this data was collected so we could assess if the intervention had any impact, if any. Um, and majority of these questions were answered on a Likert scale, um, where it was usually like one to four or one to six, with one being the lowest response, six being the highest. Um, we included the generalized self-efficacy scale, which assesses one's belief in their overall ability to handle obstacles or difficulties. This consists of 10 items. We use the scale of body connection to assess body awareness and body dissociation. That consists of 20 items. We use the self-compassion short form to measure um, participant self-compassion, as you could potentially glean from the title, um, which self-compassion for the authors was defined as the ability to hold feelings of suffering with a sense of wor warmth, connection, and concern. This consists of 12 items. We use the GAD7, a familiar measure for us. Um, seven item scale allows us to assess for generalized anxiety disorder. Patient health questionnaire, the PQ9, uh, is used to diagnose depression. We included that item that had about nine items on that. And then we use the gender minority stress and resilience measure. This measure assesses minority stress and resilience factors, specifically in transgender diverse um, folks. And Braden was mentioning the minority stress model earlier. This scale was designed actually in response to that earlier research. Minority stress, when that was originally published out in 2003, um, was specifically about sexual minorities. Testa and their colleagues looked at that and they said, you know what, I think this is super applicable to trans folks. And so while Braden was also thinking this um, and trying to figure out how to implement that with trans on the binary, there were also these researchers over here, researchers over here doing the same thing. Um, and so they created this scale uh, to specifically hone in on the things that are impacting trans folks. This scale has 58 items. It's quite hefty and it's got nine subscales. For the purposes of our pilot, we used six subscales. We used the non-affirmation subscale, the internalized transphobia of one, pride, negative expectations for the future, non-disclosure and community connectedness. We also wanted to gauge people's levels of stress. Um, so APA put out a Stress in America survey back in 2022. Braden took that and adapted that to our population to think about specific sources of stress that trans folks might be encountering. And we had that narrowed down to about 17 different types. Had folks rate that, how much that was impacting their lives, each one, whether it be finances, whether it be legislation that they're seeing in their state, whether it be legislation federally, um, whether it be election results, stuff like that. And then we also included open-ended questions that asked about folks' experiences with support groups, therapy, mindfulness. And then at the end, what folks found surprising when participating, what helped them the most, what they found challenging, areas for improvement, stuff like that. This was a lot. <laughs> um, and because it was such a hefty scale, 
uh, hefty survey, mind you, and people took it twice. Uh, we did pay them for their time to, to make sure that they were compensated for that labor. So what do we find? Um, if you're keeping track of the timeline, we closed the pilot in mid-May and not a lot of time has passed since then. But um, we have sound some preliminary findings. We wanted to share that with you today. We've got some more stuff probably coming in the future though. It's just, we need more time to comb through the data. So what did we see? Quantitatively, we found that our participants completed an average of 6.3 sessions out of eight. Um, and we ran paired t-tests to compare the pre-programmed scores um, against post-programmed scores. We found some really interesting, significant differences. Um, we saw that folks' scores of self-efficacy, body awareness, bodily connection, self-compassion, and community connect connectedness were significantly different at the end of the program from the scores they had reported originally before the program started. We didn't find any significant change in anxiety, depression, non-affirmation, internalized transphobia, negative expectations for the future, non-disclosure, or pride, however. Qualitatively, um, we looked at all of the information that people were providing text-wise in our text boxes. Um, and when it came to what worked, we had participants reporting that they really enjoyed the small group setting. Um, and and some folks were telling us that they didn't even want to like, they didn't want it to end. They, they loved being in their group and, and connecting with their peers every week. They also found the topics really, really helpful. Um, some folks remarked that they were really surprised that this worked for them. Like they came into it quite skeptical, actually. They're like, eh, you know, I'm not sure this is actually going to do much for me, but why not give it a shot? Um, and they, they were like, wow, actually this did work. Um, Interestingly, some of these folks mentioned that they had tried to incorporate some of the skills that we had folks learn and practice into their lives before taking part in trans wellness, trans brilliance, but they hadn't been able to make it quite click or quite work previously. A lot of people had heard of the concept of mindfulness, maybe had been thrown like a mindfulness exercise by a therapist, but they, they just, they didn't use it. They didn't know what to do with it. During this program though, they were like, ah, okay. I see this, this is working for me. And they kept with it. Other things that people reported were specifically helpful skill-wise were mindful breathing, identifying emotions, developing different relationships with those emotions instead of getting down on themselves whenever they were having a hard moment, identifying sources of stress, and advanced planning on how to emotionally regulate and specifically activating situations. Um, we also got a lot of feedback from our peer support specialists and we're still trying to comb through all that. We've got a lot of, a lot of data. Um, but the peer support specialists that took part in this, for the most part, reported learning a lot about themselves and, and learning things that they could take back to their own local communities, um, which was really exciting. In terms of challenges, um, our participants reported that they were dealing with a lot during the time that this program took place um, that didn't have anything to do with the program itself. They were encountering outside stressors that involved um, medical challenges, housing insecurity, uh, illness and injury, employment. Some folks had just been laid off. Some folks were still in the process of finding jobs. Um, There's a lot of things grappling at the same time with, and some folks also mentioned like, there, were, there was a lot of content. Um, and so sometimes they had trouble remembering the skills and exercises um, because there was so much to keep track of. But in general, what we saw here with this project was that after participating in trans wellness, trans brilliance, folks reported feeling more efficacy in their lives. They reported feeling more aware of their bodies, feeling more connected to their bodies, feeling more compassion for themselves and feeling more connected to the trans community than they had previous to participating. These differences would suggest that participating in this program increased all of these things for the better. Um, and as I kind of alluded to before, the context and the framing of these wellness and, and coping skills 
really mattered um, because it was presented in the, within the context of their own lives as trans people um, by folks who shared similar experiences to them. It, it felt like something they could actually use. It felt accessible in a way that maybe something presented by like a, a cisgender heterosexual therapist previously hadn't. Braden, I'll let you continue with the rest of this. Thank you. And so one thing that I want to highlight when we're thinking about implications and why does this matter? What I want to highlight is this year comparative to last year. So like last year in 2022, it was well known that there was a large growing directed attack making trans individuals increasingly more of a national topic with a lot of funding going into these issues. And 2023 actually exceeds the amount of sponsored, presented anti-trans legislation across the United States. I want to highlight this because if you think about our intervention, we just looked at Michigan. And in Michigan, within a week, essentially, we had 100, over 170 responses of people who wanted this program. And Michigan, comparative to other states, is considered a safe state. So what I wanted to highlight is that the, the national implications for providing programs and services like this, reaching rural areas, reaching people where they're actually at, regardless of proximity to local resources. The fact that there were so many people before we even knew that there were evidence that this actually affects positive change, the want and the need and the desire for these programs exists and is there. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've gotten a lot of information so far and we're, we're still, like I said, trying to make sense of it all. Um, but we're, we're starting to think through next steps. Um, and in order to contextualize where we might go next with trans wellness, trans brilliance, it would be important for us to highlight limitations because um, this is definitely gonna help us figure out what we need to do. So limitation wise, I alluded to this earlier, IRB approval took a while for us to get, in fact, it took about 15 months for us to get this. We had done three IRBs. The first two, the one with the stakeholder interviews and one with focus groups, those were super quick, went by, um, not a problem. The third one for this pilot program took a really long time. And a large part of that was because the University of Michigan IRB process is not set up well to, for community-based research. Um, it often kind of gatekeeps who's allowed to participate as a researcher in a project, um, depending on their proximity and their affiliation with the university or a university of higher education. Um, there was a lot of vetting that had to take place to make sure that all of our staff, the facilitators, could be on this project. Um, and we're in the process of writing up some thoughts on this because it was incredibly frustrating process that it shouldn't have taken that long. Um, but because it did take so long, our timeline got kind of rushed. Um, we were originally supposed to, I think we originally were supposed to start groups in 2022 um, and that didn't happen. And so we had to ask for a, a grant extension. We got thankfully awarded to the end of May of this year. And, and so by the time we got IRB approval, end of February, beginning of March, we really had to jump into gear. Um, up until that point, we had kind of been waiting and hoping something was going to come through soon. Um, and then we, it was quite quick. We had to get going as soon as possible. Um, what we realized along the way is because we had to start fast, um, was that we needed more time for facilitator training and that just wasn't given the space that it needed. We, we did training, but could have done more. Um, and we didn't feel, we realized we didn't have enough funding actually. Um, there was a lot of work that facilitators were doing outside of the groups themselves on Zoom 
in their own lives of crafting uh, slide decks and identifying and, and reading up on the topics because they were not licensed professional, like licensed clinicians. They didn't have that training already. Um, and then the other thing we realized was there are a lot of holidays in April and May that we did not account for. Uh, we had four groups running all at the same time. Um, one on Sundays, two on third, two were on Wednesdays, and then there was one on Saturdays. The Sunday group, Easter came up, uh, and then Mother's Day, and so we had to work kind of around those holidays. There were also other limitations in terms of how much participants were able to engage, and I'll let Braden talk about that. Yes, thank you. And and one thing to say, really, I think it's worthwhile mentioning is that when we en envisioned this this pilot at the very beginning, one of the one thing that we wanted to kind of identify is, do we have content that could be replicated by singularly peer support specialists? So I think that also influenced the amount of emphasis on training, in addition to the fact that, uh, you know, the funding limitations that Cecil had mentioned. So I wanted to highlight that too, because we wanted to see how, what does it require to do the most minimally viable program, if that makes sense? And so, um, you know, those are some of the learning lessons that we're taking forward in terms of what we can definitely do better to, like, what would be effective training and in, in on different topics too. But as far as focusing on limitations around uh, participant engagement, I think this is really important to highlight. So uh, as Cecil had mentioned, we found in our post-tests and pre-tests that there's a lot of stress in people's lives. And we had some individuals who either were not able to actually participate or uh, were not able to finish. Some of them we don't under we don't know why, but for some we do. And so some of the themes that had come up were change of work schedule uh, and the inability to continue to commit and preserve that time. And we can connect that to the fact that the lower income levels of our community can make individuals and participating even more vulnerable to that and having less autonomy on when they're able to maintain certain commitments due to resource scarcity and, and needing to, you know, do what it takes, work multiple jobs, et cetera. Other components is that this was an intergenerational uh, and beyond just being intergenerational, there's a lot of different tech uses. And, uh, you know, people have different levels of uh, familiarity with different platforms and how they use technology. And so the access and the fact that there was a lot of content, as, as Cecil had mentioned, there's a lot of uh, maintaining all of these skills. And when you're providing it to people, not in a tangible form, but a digital form, that can also create barriers to fuller participation. In addition to just needing to have the access to be able to join from a technology standpoint, and then also living situation. We know that uh, one individual who was not able to participate was in a situation where they were they had no disclosure with the people living around them. So their family, the family that they had built with their partner, where they were living, they did not have that safety and privacy uh, and, and they were not able to participate. So it could have related to other factors, but that was one thing that stood out for us. And then multiple individuals were either able we're required to, uh, we're not able to finish or not able to participate listing reasons such as medical emergencies, mental health emergencies, family emergencies. Um, and then as far as when we talk about actually being in the space and being able to fully engage, we learned a lot around individuals of uh, non-binary backgrounds, gender non-conforming and so forth, where there were reports of not feeling trans enough. So there's limitations there in terms of being able to create space where people can understand that uh, your experience doesn't have to match this quote unquote normative kind of uh, experience or, you know, how you move through the world. And then these spaces are still valid. So, and these people and their identities are still valid. So, uh, and then another, there's just inherent limitations to this program and, and there foreseeably will continue to be because trans wellness, trans brilliance, is not a substitute for care. It is a supplement to care. Uh, it is not a therapy group. It's not supposed to replace a therapy group. It's not supposed to replace therapy. It's also not well suited for crisis stabilization and individuals who are going through acute, acute trauma where they need higher levels of care or uh, more qualified 
issue specific tr high level trauma specific space of peers to delve into those things um, ethically and effectively. <clears throat> and when we think about where we want to go from here uh, to kind of ground on the fact of our original methods, our original methodology and methods has been focused on learning from our community and letting the community drive what this looks like and the content. And when we look back on what we put together, we recognize in future iterations that there's incredible opportunities to draw from some of the underlying mechanisms of some of what we actually did do and some things that we could do differently. So positive psychology and motivational psychology. There are things around, you know, visualization and mental contrasting and different things that we know uh, and have available within the discipline of psychology to really be able to um, incorporate more intentionally and thoughtfully in future iterations. And so that way we can, our ultimate goal is to do something that's community led and that is effective and that we have enduring uh, that we hopefully see enduring, um, enduring and sustained benefits. Um, there's other disciplines too that we could actually learn from beyond psychology, such as uh, within the educational realm, there's a lot in terms of emergent learning and self-directed education, which I think we could really learn from and how we curate this co-learning space among peers. Uh, when we think about research within technology, there's a ton of methods and practices and processes to really do what's conducted is called user experience research. So in a sense, in a sense, it's like, how do people engage with technology? So someone who's connecting to this program with a smartphone is going to have a different experience engaging with the, the materials than someone who can open up a laptop. So how do we design this in a way that can be effective and accessible? And Beyond these other disciplines, we have, as Cecil mentioned, we have incredible data to, to go through and comb through just from our participants who are highly engaged and our wonderful peer support specialists who are also highly engaged. Um, we learned from them. I mean, they shared with us, hey, if you were to, if this is the way that we would have done it <laughs> around training, this is the way that we would have done it around the content. And we're like, that would have been amazing to A, have budget line items for, but B, like, let's do it. Like, that's awesome. So there's a lot of opportunity to really hone in on not only the platform, but the content. And what I mean by content, I mean, how do we curate discussions that pull out and engage people who might be sitting there and feeling like, I don't feel trans enough. My experience isn't the same as this other person's experience. So how do we harmonize through that diversity more, that diversity of experience effectively? How do we create activities that are really helpful for, like, for instance, Cecil had mentioned mindfulness. Mindfulness is something that gets thrown around a lot, but there's a lot of nuances to it and there's a lot of ways to personalize it. So how can we work towards uh, bridging the gap with people who might have a harder time connecting in those ways? And this, again, is something that positive psychology offers a, a lot of beautiful lens around just the efficacy that comes from interventions that just teach on growth mindset and neuroplasticity. So there's a lot of opportunities that we can use to engage people who are, uh, you know, even uh, some of our peer support specialists said, hey, if you're uh, trying to make this accessible for someone who's neurodivergent or uh, is, is autistic, fact-based, matter of fact, give the science behind it. That would actually be really beneficial. So there's a lot of opportunities that we have to really curate this content but then also how do we make it easy for people to access? So it could be like workbook and tools. Um, and then the other thing that came out that was really important to, to note is that our intervention uh, feedback that we got from clinicians who have expertise in like somatic, uh, somatic interventions um, in therapy, uh, the feedback that we got is that even though we were tapping into mindfulness and talking about emotions and sensations and body awareness, it was done in a very cognitive heavy way so there's a lot of opportunities that we could partner with people who have expertise in facilitating this. Um, and then also making sure that we go through this content in a way that is ethical and um, you know has good efficacy for peers to be able to provide. So 
And we hope that in the future interventions, we're able to actually address mechanisms of anxiety and depression as well. We've also learned, so that, that's about the content. We've also learned a lot around uh, this, this journey together of creating this program. And there's a lot of takeaways that we have on how to uh, do things differently from a pilot design standpoint beyond the actual content intervention and, and, and uh, delivery of it. So one of the things that we'd be very interested in looking at is when we look at these changes, number one, can we actually address some mechanisms for anxiety and depression? Can we move that needle at all? Two, of the benefits that we see, are they enduring? Are they sustaining? Trans Wellness, Trans Brilliance, we did not have built in like a follow-up. We might even find from the follow-up that if people who stick with these skills, maybe when we think back to our focus group where they said, hey, I don't know how realistic eight weeks you're going to see that much change. Maybe one intervention is enough if people continue to practice the, pro the, the skills. We might find that the, Moodle, the, the needle does start to move around anxiety and depression. Uh, we also know that in terms of creating the content and testing the content, we would love to have more focus group iterations. That way we could do more dynamic interactive testing. And this was actually something that we had realized that one focus group wasn't enough. But we also got feedback from our peer support specialist on ideas around how to pilot the content with people who are going to be facilitating the program. And that would be very interactive, experiential learning while also allowing you to incrementally make those changes in an iterative process. Um, and then as far as just some of the actual uh, delivery of measures, uh, there's a lot of process improvements that we could do in terms of like streamlining um, you know, how we do follow-up reflections, reminders to participants, things that we, we saw that uh, in some groups there was like a taper off of the weekly reflections. And we believe that because that was across the group, we believe that we could take that in mind and get even greater uh, data completion uh, by taking some of those things in mind and, and, and getting higher completion rates on the surveys. In addition to the fact that something that's very important that we need to improve on is directly linking participants with affirming care services. So, yeah, I mean, this is, thank you all so much for, for attending. We're going to go to the QA, but what we really want to make some space for is just thanking everyone who's involved in this project. Uh, first and foremost, our facilitators. Uh, Everyone who was engaged in this project, uh, it was a long, winding uh, <laughs> journey, <laughs> and uh, it was a lot of wait around and then rush, uh, drink from that fire hydrant and go. Um, and we honestly couldn't be here presenting this to you if we did not have such wonderful people who were engaged and were able to show up and wanted to make things better for their community and. We really honor and value that. And we've learned so much from not only them making this program possible by delivering it, but also how engaged they've been in providing feedback and reflections and, and, and helping us understand how we could do this better in the future. And we also want to think like we have a peer support advisor who is a member of Transcend, who we decided we're not going to allocate to a, a peer support specialist role because we wanted to engage even more people from the community. So Transcend financially sponsored uh, an advisor role. So that way, a member of our team who does provide peer support could also inform, um, understand how if when we do this in the future, have more institutional knowledge, uh, someone who's closer to the peer support specialist and so forth. And then also the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. Um, it's been I'm absolutely incredible to take ideas, learning from the community and actually being gifted the capacity to do something with it. And I think it's absolutely incredible for, uh, you know, when there is that <laughs> financial redistribution that goes down to the grassroots because we are able to do some pretty incredible things with it. And we are incredibly appreciative of that as well as all of our research support. Uh, I've been so thankful to, to work with uh, very supportive researchers from the University of Michigan. I'm not officially affiliated in any way, but apparently uh, like to do a lot of, a lot of work with 
folks from U of M who are associated as your research. So, uh, and, and to Dr. Katari to be able to help allow us to be able to do this and, and kind of see our vision through. Uh, so we just definitely want to say those acknowledgements because uh, this truly is community led and it, it, we wouldn't be able to do this without community engagement and support. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I don't know, do you think Transcend, Brayden, your own organization, Transcend? The <laughs> that, that was uh, uh, Yes, thing. thank you. Thank you to Transcend for approving uh, to sponsor these other surveys and <laughs> for sponsoring another role uh, and contributing financially when we are very uh, shoestring budget as is. So thank you. <laughs> and yeah, we had wonderful team members who gave a lot of informative insight all throughout the process. So absolutely. Thank you to my team. Yeah. Thanks, Cecil. <laughs> so we've done a, we've done a lot of talking uh, for a long time, and and so we'll reserve the the last sixteen minutes or so um, to just kind of go through questions. I see some stuff has already popped up in the uh, the Q and A, and so we can start going through that. But also feel free to raise your hand. Um, whatever works. Would love to hear your thoughts and your your feedback. So let's start at the top. Uh, we had a question about how many groups were the 23 in? So there were four groups. Um, and those 23 people were spread out across those four different groups that met at different times in the week. Um, those groups uh, met at times we pre-decided were um, available for both of the facilitators, the pre peer support specialist and the clinician. Um, and then we, we asked folks when they were being recruited which times on their schedule worked best from them. So we didn't have to do a lot of um, when to meets and back and forth questions about availability. Hope that helps, Janet. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, question about panel for participants and peer support specialists. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's any peer support specialists that are here that want to chat um, and share stuff, uh, feel free. I, I think in terms of confidentiality, I'm I'm not going to request that participants share their experience uh, just because uh, we told them that we weren't going to tell people who participate, like who they were. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, is there anyone here that is a peer support specialist that wanted to share anything? Great to, to, to volunteer. And I also think that that is a, is a wonderful idea. I know that for, um, well, I don't want to take up airspace, but I, I, I know that one thing that we'd be very, when we're moving forward, we want to go back to the folks that were involved in this project and create opportunities in that way and be more involved earlier in the process in terms of like, what could a budget look like? What could a budget go for to incorporate ideas? So I think that absolutely going, we have not tapped the resources of our peer support specialists to the fullest, uh, but we want to make sure that we have proper funding to do that. Yeah. And also worth mentioning, we probably should have said this from the beginning, there are a variety of papers that are coming out of this project. Um, mm -hmm. So this will not be the only time you hear about this. Um, those papers um, were still getting off the ground, but we have folks who were on the facilitator team who've expressed interest in helping write those. And so we'll definitely be hearing some of their experiences in that as well. Um, let's see. Next question. Ah, recording be available to rewatch. I don't see a problem with that. I I think we could make that happen for sure. Um, let's let's see how well it recorded first before <laughs> before we <laughs> send it to people. Um, and let's see. We had a question about why did we include so many disabled participants? That was not intentional. Um, it it just happened to work out that way. Um, I, I think back when we were selecting folks for recruitment, we, we tried to keep a holistic mindset in terms of ensuring that there wasn't an over saturation of trans mask folks or of, of white folks. And I think we, we may have also been thinking about like 
making sure that they weren't all just able-bodied people, but yeah, it just kind of was a coincidence that we, we had so many folks finish um, who reported some type of disability and we didn't dig too much in this. Um, this question was more so like, do you identify as a person with a disability? So it could have run the gamut of anything really. To also tag on to that as well, we really looked at it from like an intersectional standpoint. So we we had we wanted, as Cecil mentioned earlier, we looked at having 50% folks of color. And from there, we also weighted uh, you know, economic access and sociodemographic uh, status from, from the, that regard, that was definitely weighted. And so we would have looked at you know, someone having disabilities as being, we wanted to really make opportunities for folks in the community who would definitely benefit. So we had an intersectional lens, but we did not have like a specific goal around how many folks that we wanted to participate around disability. I think it also speaks to the fact that there are high rates of disability within the community. So I think that that is definitely part of what we're seeing. Um, so, and we also balanced geography too. So like geography was a definitely really important weight yeah. when we selected folks. Yeah, um, it's important with mentioning the geography part that we, um, we did specifically think about like areas that are really affluent in Michigan um, that we thought folks might have more access to services in versus other folks who lived in more rural areas. Um, so try to keep that in mind. I see there's a question about um, areas where there were not significant differences after the eight weeks. Yeah, uh, let's hop back up to the quantitative section. So we didn't see any significant changes in anxiety, depression, non-affirmation, internalized transphobia, negative expectations for the future, non-disclosure, and pride. Um, that doesn't mean that there weren't changes. It just means in terms of the way we do statistical analysis that it, um, it wasn't a significant enough change for us to think that it, um, that it couldn't just be to ch due to chance, I guess is more so what I, I should be saying there. So like the p-values, all of these little, little guys over here, um, they weren't above 0.05. Um, the numbers were different though. In fact, I, we were thinking there were gonna be significant changes in anxiety and depression, just looking at the means when we first got the numbers, because there wasn't like, the numbers were different. Um, anxiety and depression scores were lower at the end of the intervention. It just, it didn't cross our threshold for making sure that this was Scientific, scientifically regulars. Um, and that's that. why we do have some questions on if people were to continue and take these skills away where we, we asked, you know, questions around what do you think you might take with you with the program? If people were to continue, we might see that anxiety in an eight-week period is harder to reduce, but over a longer period of time. Um, so maybe one treatment intervention such as this, or maybe multiple. I mean, there's a lot of questions there around how do we address that, but those are definitely our goals uh, long-term and in the next uh, next iter iteration to leverage what we can from psychological science and really try to adjust and, and treat those mechanisms that can create those changes. Yeah. And also worth mentioning, this is a very tiny sample size, super small. Um, the fact that we found any significant changes at all is, is quite remarkable. Um, if we had had more participants, um, those significant changes may have been more pronounced for some of those other um, other scales that we were measuring. Um, but yeah, more stuff that it's uh, on my to do list for us to dig into. Um, Got to run some more, run some more analyses, and do some more coding. And I think another thing too is like with a larger a larger sample, like doing a more, like a larger pilot. I think we would, we didn't mention this earlier, but we didn't randomize the question ordering, which we initially were thinking about doing, but then we didn't. So I think that there's some opportunities there as well that could potentially result in those differences. Yeah. Yeah. Also streamlining the amount of questions people are being swamped with. Taking a survey that's really long, um, 
you know, we, we have to think about like, oh, how, how truthful are people are answering? Uh, are they getting tired? Um, what's happening for them in that moment? Because you, you never really know. Um, in terms of Danny's question, Will there be opportunities in the future for folks to participate in one of the groups that didn't get invited for this initial tri trial? We hope so, yeah. Um, so one of the questions we asked in our recruitment survey when we were originally trying to find participants was would you like to stay updated on, on future um, opportunities with this particular project or just trans research in general? Um, and so we, have a, a lot of people that we will certainly be reaching out to in the future to be like, hey, part two is coming around. You expressed interest before. Would you like to take part? Um, we really hope so. We just uh, we need to we need to do some more thinking about revising, and we need to find funding uh, to try to get this going again. Because participating as just a group member and facilitating are, are both labor that should be compensated. Um, and we wanna make sure that everybody's um, getting fairly treated for their time. Brayden, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, so we actually, when we closed down the sign up survey, we created another interest form. So I'm gonna drop this into the chat. I believe I can throw it here for everyone to see. Mm. Um, let's go back. Okay, type answer for Danny. Okay, so that form that I dropped into the chat and it's also on our website and I'm gonna throw it onto Ollie's response too just so that way it's there visible for everyone, I think. Um, but essentially if if folks were to share that, it it's an, just another way to say, hey, I'm interested and here's the different ways that I'd like to be interested in either programs, services, research or volunteering. And we will definitely keep people in the loop. Yeah. And then speaking of all these questions, a uh, question about the slides being available. If folks are interested in slides, happy to email those out. Um, you can just shoot me an email um, at, here, I'll put it in the, put it in the chat, like the technology working. <laughs> uh, you can just shoot me an email and I can pass you along a PDF of this stuff. Um, and then Arthur asked, how can one join future studies like this as a participant? Yeah, so when we get this going again, uh, definitely gonna be doing email blast um, and also using our social media platforms. Transcend is really well equipped to reach a lot of folks. Uh, they, they, know how to, they know how to do their stuff. Um, and so if you keep up with Transcend the Binary, Braden's organization, um, you will definitely see something come around. And we also, we have so many dedicated people who have been part of this project that we will share stuff with and they'll pass that along to their, their friends and, and, and followers as well. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Trans on the Binary's trans wellness page is probably gonna be the best place to, to stay up to date on anything that happens next. And you can specifically email that email as well, the, the TWTB at transcendthebinary.org uh, mm -hmm. and just indicate that you would like to be a partner in some capacity, participate in some capacity, um, and we'll definitely, you know, or fill out the form, either works, um, but that will go directly to our team. And then we will be using, um, you know, our recruitment list, sign up forms, such as what we've listed. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and then we don't have a question, but it's just, uh, it's just some love for Brayden in the <laughs> q &A. Um, so great to see how Thanks. far this has come. Yeah, it's true. This is, this has come a really long way. Um, it's kind of wild how long it's taken, um, from the very beginnings of Brayden, even thinking about this to, to now it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah. It's the, it's the first intervention that anyone on our team has done. And this is an area that I want to continue building expertise in, in terms of interventions and, you know, how can we effectively advance change? Because we, our community deserves it. And 
I believe that there's, uh, even though we're, we're focusing on how to target for a very specific community, we're a very diverse community. And so I do believe that in pursuing a very intersectionally focused approach will also be generalizable in its own way to other experiences and communities, because that's really what it comes down to, right? Like there's trans people exist everywhere. Uh, non-binary people exist everywhere. And there's a lot of intersecting experiences that, you know, when we can adapt to those needs, um, you know, we're, I believe in our ability to, you know, create change in meaningful ways. Yeah. Okay. Well, got one minute till one thirty. Um, this has been almost exactly an hour and a half. That's awesome. Um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna close things down. Oh, wait, what's, <laughs> uh, okay. Other, <laughs> <more long. laughs> um, in the, in the Q and a, um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna close things down, um, and, and let people head back to their days, but thank you so much for being here today and, and listening to us ramble about this project and, and learning what we've been up to. Um, you'll see more from us. We'll be in touch for sure. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.